My name is Ted Ferreira. I am a 1977 graduate of the Refrigeration and Appliance Repair Program. I have served on the Alumni Board of Managers and am currently a trustee here at Humboldt College of Technology. And it's my great privilege this morning to welcome you all here to the latest in the C. Charles Jackson Lectures on Leadership. There? Wow. <laughs> so did you all get that? Okay. So uh, this series was created uh, about a year and a half ago under the auspices of the Alumni Board of Managers with some funding from the Jackson family. And it's intended to uh, give us at Dudley an opportunity to come together to network and do a little learning in the process. Uh, to bring together students, alumni, faculty, staff, anyone of interest in the subject of leadership. I'm looking forward today uh, to hearing from our speaker, Greg Stedronsky. I know Greg uh, as a member of our Board of Trustees. He joined the board about a year ago, and I can tell you that he's been very active, very involved, um, he brings great wisdom and insight to our board and has been particularly helpful in advising us on our four-year engineering programs, which are a new initiative and a very important one here at Dunley. We are very fortunate to have an executive of his stature with us. And to introduce him formally, I'm going to call upon Ann Hardy, Anne is a 2002 graduate of our automated machine packaging systems program. <laughs> Got that one right. Okay. Uh, believe me, I, I, I had to go back and look at my program from 77 so, uh, to get that one right. So uh, Anne has been a very active member of the Alumni Board of Managers. She is a terrific person in her own right and a great friend of Dunwoody. I give you Ann Hardy. Thank you, Ted. On behalf of the Alumni Board of Managers, welcome to our C. Charles Jackson Leadership Lecture Series program. It is my pleasure today to introduce Greg Stodronsky, Vice President of Engineering, Manufacturing Excellence, Global Safety Environment, continuous improvement at General Mills. Greg joined General Mills in 1991 and held a variety of positions in manufacturing and engineering, including leadership roles in manufacturing plants in California and Chicago. Yay, cops! <laughs> <laughs> I had to say that. I'm still excited. In 2001, Greg became the Director of Control and Information Systems where he led the development of plant floor information systems. He was named Director of Packaging Engineering in 2004 and took over engineering in 2006. In 2010, Greg assumed responsibility for global safety and environment, and in 2014, he had a responsibility for global manufacturing excellence. In his role at General Mills, Greg is accountable for capital program execution technology commercialization, global safety, and environmental leadership. Greg received his MBA from the University of Minnesota in operations management and his mechanical engineering degree from South Dakota State University. Please join me in welcoming Greg Stadronsky. She reads all that. It sounds pretty good. Um, trust me, it is uh, not that impressive. Uh, and I didn't write that, so I'm not sure where we got all that information. But it's really a pleasure for me to be here this morning to participate in this uh, Jackson lecture series. Uh, as Ted said, I've been on the board for about a year. And i got to tell you, I've been really, really impressed with the quality of people that are running this place and the quality of the students that I've met while I've been here. You should all be very proud. And uh, if you're not aware of the trajectory, of this place, I can tell you that the grand value of Dugwoody is going to grow long after most of uh, you students are out in the workplace, and, and that's a fortunate place to be. So thank you very much. I'm going to do something that might be a little different today. I want to talk about leading with safety. 
which might sound kind of strange. Now, I'm not talking about leading safety. I just got to meet somebody that was in the EHS environment, and, and I'm not talking about leading safety. I want to challenge you to think about what you lead with as a person and what your leadership uh, does in terms of the culture that you will build as a leader. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how this topic has unfolded for me over the course of my career. I'm going to show you a few of the jobs that I've had. I'm even going to show you some family pictures. So I'm going to get a little personal with you, which is a little unusual for engineers, but I think that, uh, that you'll be okay with that. So here we go. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but I think most of you are familiar with General Mills as a company. Um, what I want you to know is that this summer we celebrated 150 years as a hometown company. And in an era where sort of big food and big companies and big everything is just really under a lot of pressure and there's kind of a stigma of bad being big or big being bad, I can tell you that in my 25 years, I couldn't be more proud of the values-based approach that my company has taken. We've been an amazing corporate citizen, citizen of the world. We participate in sustainability, and we would do all the things that you would um, think could be done with a Minnesota-based company. And that will be important later, but I want to start with that. Now, as I was thinking about this pitch this morning, I thought, well, most people who talk to you probably start with a definition of leadership. So I'll do the same. I'll go and I'll Google a definition of leadership. And I went online, and I got to tell you, I was really disappointed. Have, have any of you Googled leadership? I'm sure you have. It's an act of leadership, the role of leadership. Um, nothing that really spoke to me about what I think leadership is and what will be so important to you as students as you become entrepreneurs, as you go to work for people, as you set your culture in your companies. And um, I wrote my own. So here's a couple of things that I would say speak to me about leadership. Leadership is about inspiring the mind and stirring the heart. It delivers hope. It creates energy. It inspires people to do more than they would otherwise be motivated <coughs> to do. And I think that's really the essence of leadership for me as I have experienced it in some 30 years in industry and certainly in my life. And in no part of my life am I more a leader than with my family. And these things apply everywhere. And I think you're going to find that as a, as a student who uh, enters the workplace. But there were a couple other questions that I thought were more important than this. The questions that might not seem obvious is what do you lead for? What's the outcome of leadership? And secondly, what do you lead with? Okay, those are curious questions. What do you lead for and what do you lead with? And this is kind of the thesis of my comment this morning. I would submit that you lead to create culture. That there's an innate connection between your leadership style and the culture that you create. And culture is something that you build around organizations. You're going to build it around your family. It's going to transcend generations. It's your mark on the world is your culture and your leadership style. So if that's true, then think about the connection between what you lead with. For example, if you're running an organization and you lead with sales at all costs, well, what might be the culture that results? Are you sure it would be as ethical? Are you sure you would do the right thing? <coughs> if you lead with money everywhere you turn, how might that be perceived by the people you lead? So my thesis this morning is there's something really interesting and remarkable about leading with safety. And that's what I want to talk about this morning. So I got this job uh, about eight or nine years ago. And I, uh, I thought I was ready for this job. I was a pretty good engineer. I was a good manager, I thought, a uh, pretty good director. And so I got promoted to be the head of engineering. I remember asking one of our executive vice presidents, what does it mean to be an officer? in a 100, Fortune 100 company. He told me something that stuck with me then, and I'll share it with you now. He said, from now on, you get paid to judge the judgment of others. From now on, you get paid to judge the judgment of others. And that stuck with me, and I've lived that for many years. And in no area is that more important than in leadership. You will find in all walks of life that you're going to spend a lot of time trying to identify it, hire it, nurture it, and if you ever get it wrong, you're going to spend a lot of time trying to unwind it and get it out of your organization. In no area is it more important than leadership. The other thing I started doing at that time 
I started looking around and asking myself, why are some companies better than others? I mean, we, we all sort of start out with the same technology, we go recruit the same engineers and the same finance people, et cetera, et cetera. So why is it some companies are safer, some are cheaper, some are more reliable? Why would that be? I think it's really an interesting question. And so I've been thinking about that for the last seven or eight years. I thought about how that's unfolded for me over the past 30 years of my career. And after all this time, I think I have the answer, but I'm not going to tell you right now. <laughs> Instead, I'm going to share a little of my personal journey, which begins in a really small town in South Dakota, Wagner, South Dakota, a town of 1,400 people, where my family had a hardware plumbing and heating business on Main Street for about 100 years. And it was formed as people immigrated to the Midwest. They got farms. They broke up the land to become our nation's breadbasket. This is a picture of my great-great-grandfather behind the counter of the store that I worked at as a child. And when I say I worked at it, I really did. And I started out sweeping and, and, uh, and waiting on customers and that sort of thing. But eventually, I made my way back in the shop where the mechanics were. I did. Uh, I did furnace ductwork design, I made my own elbows, and, and those sorts of things, and I loved it. In fact, one day, I remember my math teacher came in and I had to wait on him. And I had to count back change. Anybody, I'm looking at here, anybody know what that means? This side of the room knows what counting back change means. It's really a, uh, uh, a kind of a complex way of getting the change right back before the cash register told you what to do. And in front of your math teacher, you couldn't get that wrong. And I told my dad, I was so nervous, I never want to do that again. And I went out in the shop, and that's where I worked for the rest of my time. In fact, I worked as a plumber. I put myself through college as a plumber. And in, an, um, in, in fact, one year, my junior year, I was the rotor rooter guy in my hometown. And that sounds terrible, and it was. But, <laughs> But at a time when the minimum wage was a couple of bucks, I was making four or five times that. So I got to college you know, with the resources that I needed to really enjoy myself. And so I was, uh, I was thrilled about that job. And I learned a lot. You learn a lot from plumbers. Yeah, I'm going to do this joke. You all know this. Three things you need to know to be a plumber. These guys are laughing. It is Friday. Stuff runs downhill. You don't chew your fingernails. <laughs> but I learned something more important at that time, and this was something that would shape the way I would think about leadership, culture, and safety for the rest of my life. And that is this. In life, nothing is more important than safety. In life, nothing is more important than safety. Now look at some of these pictures. These were not safe times. I grew up in an era where people rode in the back windows of cars on vacation. We were practically issued motorcycles. I climbed hills I'd be embarrassed to tell you about. Helmets were optional. We were around ag equipment all the time. Farm implements and augers and very dangerous machines. If you've never stood in a pen with a 1,400 pound black Angus steer, I can tell you there's nothing more intimidating. And guns were everywhere. You have to remember that farm families at that time would hunt as a supplement to their farm incomes. And so this is going to sound crazy, but on any given day, there would have been 10 or 11 shotguns and rifles in the gun racks of the pickups that were parked in my high school parking lot. And again, this side of the room, if you don't know what a gun rack is, it's literally a rack that bolted into the window of your pickup so you could get quick access to your gun so you could hunt on the way to school. These were really different times. And in an era where <coughs> farm fatalities happened almost annually, and Darwin's law of natural selection was sort of the law of the land, it seemed, something was really different in my family. In my family, my dad, his dad, his father before him, learned a really interesting and valuable lesson. That was this. To be there for the people that you loved, or the people that you lead, or the people whose organization you're in charge of. Two things have to be true. You have got to take care of yourself, and you've got to care for others. Take care of yourself and care for others. And I find this to be 
the most remarkable lesson of what I learned back from those years. This is a picture of my father holding my son, who is now a 22-year-old mechanical engineering student at Iowa State. And I show you this picture because when I look at it, it brings to life the emotion of what I'm trying to get across to you today. That's a man that understands his place in the circle of life. He understands the responsibility and the impact he has at setting culture and creating an environment that feels safe for the child that he's holding. My child knows what it's like to live in a culture that creates a safe feeling. And I believe this this safe feeling, this culture of caring, is the basis of human motivation. It's why kids want to please their parents. It's why workers want to please their boss, bosses that care. It is an amazingly motivating and powerful thing. And we don't, we don't think enough about the interaction of being safe, living in a culture that cares, and human performance. Now, another lesson I learned at the time was it's not about the tools of the technology. We didn't have much technology back then. We had a lot of tools. But today we live in an era where technology enables us to do things we couldn't have imagined. But it doesn't replace the human element of what leadership is, what caring is. Those phones in your pocket, they don't care. They don't, in fact, they not only don't create a culture that cares, I would argue that they're chipping away at the culture of caring if we're not careful. And so it's not the technology, it's the people. And you're going to learn that. And whether you're an entrepreneur, whether you're working for somebody, if you don't think you're in the people business, you're not getting it. I know you're here because you love technology, you love machines, you love things. You're going to spend more time with people than things. And that may be the hardest part of the jobs you're going to have in the future. So I didn't take over the hardware store. I went to college. I got an engineering degree. I found myself working in a large manufacturing plant in the middle of Illinois. I was in charge of the engineering and maintenance organizations, and we were expanding. We were doing big, big capital projects, putting in uh, ovens and, and cookers and kitchens the size of houses. We put in conveyor systems. We measured them in fractions of a mile. This was big, big stuff. And I was responsible for maintenance. And at the time, our safety performance was really bad, really bad. And I was a young engineer, a young manager, and I was going to turn it around and get credit for it. And I remember calling all the maintenance mechanics around the table one day and say, saying to them, what are we going to do to improve our safety performance? Which in my mind seemed like a reasonable question. What do you think they heard? What they heard is, here's somebody that does not care about me as a person. Here's somebody that cares about his career. Here's somebody that wants to manage the metric. Here's somebody that doesn't understand real people get hurt in real life. And I just told them without telling them that I didn't care. I got to tell you, I learned some hard lessons at that time. And we went through some tough times. At the end of it, I was so pleased because I took away something that would shape the way I would think forever. And I'd, I'd love it if you would think about this, that if you're interacting with people, nobody cares about what you know until they know how much you care. That'll be true if you're running maintenance organizations. That'll be true in your family. That'll be true in almost all walks of life. Find great leaders, great managers. What's the one thing their, their subordinates or their coworkers will say? What do they care about? Culture of caring. Think about that as a leadership element. So in 2001, I became director of controls and information systems, as was said earlier. It was really a cool job. Our, our job at the time was to take the computer technology that existed in the world, apply it to our factories to drive efficiency and to automate dangerous jobs. And this was a, a pretty welcome strategy. It was really a fun job. We did a lot of great work then. But if you were working in one of our large manufacturing sites, when it came to controls, technology, if you will, right? Remember, it's not the tools of people. Here's what people wanted. Here's what we gave them. <laughs> this is the General Mills Control and Information System Standard Architecture. Now, if you're an engineer, this is a beautiful thing. It's a work of art. I love this. I helped create it. But if you're a maintenance mechanic or an operator, somebody trying to, to, to make a living every day uh, working, this looks like what? Complexity. 
And when you're working with all the big stuff I talked to you about earlier, complexity equals danger. If you were a mechanic and you didn't get it right, you didn't de-energize things when you were doing a maintenance activity, there was stored power, um, bad things could happen. And so I learned another lesson at this time, and that is this. Simplicity is an act of caring. Simplicity is an act of caring. Anywhere you go in life, if you make things simpler for people, if you remove barriers as a leader, you are going to be perceived as a caring leader. It's what you do. In fact, own a company sometime. Um, Ted can talk to you about this. You probably spend more time removing barriers than doing the job you thought you were going to do when you started your company. It's a big, big deal. In fact, I pulled out this quote. Um, Simplicity is the ultimate sophistication, said by a person who was a pretty good designer in his day. So, a lesson that I learned. In 2004, I became director of packaging engineering. It was really an interesting time. The emergence of Walmart and everyday low pricing had changed what shelves looked like across the nation. And counts of products were changing. So you won't remember this, but this side again might. I'm realizing which side of the room I'm lining up with um, <laughs> demographically. Um, and so we were changing a lot of packages. 12 count became 10 count, 10 count became 8. And we had created some proprietary packaging technology that was very flexible. And we were putting it across all of our factories at the same time to service the, the unbelievable growth in Walmart and other retailers at that time. And what you might expect is that if you give a lot of different organizations the same technology, you get similar performance. And yet that's not at all what we saw. It was a fabulous learning lab, right? Here's all these, these parts of uh, factories around the world that have the same exact stuff, and yet the performance varied greatly. And you say, well, how can that be? Why would that be? And the answer was, ironically, as we got looking at this, those cultures, those organizations that were more grounded in safety, People who had led with safety, that had created a culture that cared about you, we we're getting more out of the same stuff as everybody else. And that's fascinating. In fact, we looked at this over long periods of time in our corporation. The, the gold line is our safety performance. The blue line is an adjusted set of uh, outputs, kind of an index of our company output. As we get safer, we get better. As we get safer, we get better. And that, that might seem counterintuitive, or really, are you sure? But I guarantee you, you never saw an unsafe factory or an unsafe business that ran well. I guarantee it. And you think about other cultures in the world where performance and safety are linked. Because I'm asking it, right? The question you should be asking, I'm asking the lead with safety. What other cultures in the world are linked? What about these people? Do you think when they sit down and start mapping out their routines, they're leading with speed or power to weight ratios? or maneuvers, what do they lead with? Safety. If you're a pilot, you don't care about anything until you know somebody cares about the fact that you're coming home at the end of a flight, or a mission, or an exhibition, etc. And I would argue these people can't do what they do until they know they're safe. Can you imagine flying one of these things, wondering if the person next to you is going to clip your wing? You've got to have trust in your colleagues. And so leading with safety and the culture that creates is an amazing phenomenon to me. So finally, last example. Today I support our global head of supply chain. And to oversimplify it, what we, what we do is we take demand signals from retailers for products. We expose that demand signal to the factories that make our products, the kitchens, the ovens. And then we expose that demand to the companies that provide the agricultural products that are our products. It's oats, it's corn, it's those sorts of things. But as we've gotten more global, I found that this intersection of safety and culture gets to be kind of interesting. And so a quick story. I was um, giving a speech to our engineering and R&D organization, and I said, if anybody in the world ever experiences a, a situation where some person is in imminent danger, then you have my authority to shut the job down. You have my authority to shut the job down. It was very clear. Um, there's a young lady in about the fourth row. I can picture her as I stand here right now. Listen to every word. Um, ironically, she was from China, really good engineer. And about three weeks later, we asked her to go to uh, China 
to help support some process work we had going. We were building a yo play factory just outside of Shanghai at the time. And she got on the site, my words ringing in her ears, and if any of you are familiar with construction methodologies in China, go back a decade or so, things have improved a lot lately, but um, it wasn't good. Certainly not by our standards. It isn't today. I saw about the mining accident just two days ago in China. So, and by the way, these are not my pictures. These are stock pictures I just pulled off the internet, but they give you the idea. So she, she went out of the job site, saw that we were picking bricks, it wasn't us, it was a construction company we had hired. The loads weren't particularly well tied down. These were being delivered to scaffolding of all things. And she believed that the swing radius was going to compromise some of the safe zones that we mark out in our factory. So she went up to the project manager, said this is an imminent danger situation. We have to shut this job down until it's safe. And the project manager welcomed her with open arms and gave her a big hug. And, no, no. <laughs> no, I didn't. She got an earful. What are you talking about? Project cost, project schedule, pressure this, pressure that. And who are you from North America corporate? We don't really need your help, thank you. So, unsatisfied and undeterred, she went into the plant manager's office, had the same discussion, got the same result. Kind of frustrated, she called corporate Minneapolis. And I'd like to tell you it was easy, but we had a tough decision, right? We were about to set culture that was going to be the story that gets told around the world. Now, it didn't take us very long to get to the right thing. We shut the job down. And that sent an unbelievable message of what we were going to lead with. What did we just lead with? Money? Project schedule? Fill in the blank. We led with safety. And that had an unbelievable impact. Now, i got to tell you in all honesty, she paid a high price for that. There's, you, you can imagine how welcome she wasn't in that job site, be it for corporate. So I'm not going to tell you it's easy, but what I, I bring it up because it took me back to lessons that I knew when I was all the way back to my dad's hardware store. Nothing is more important than safety. Leadership creates a culture, and if you don't have faith in the people, you're going to get it wrong. So I've come full circle. In, in, in my dad's hardware store, I fully understood nothing was more important than safety and this culture of caring. When I was out in the plant, it was about nobody caring what you knew until they knew how much you cared. In the controls job that I had, simplicity was an act of caring. In the packaging world, um, uh, as, as I said, it was all about dealing with the complexity of packaging. And, um, and with Target in recent days, it comes back to it's all about the people and there's nothing important more important than safety. Now, I've been lucky because in every job that I've had with the company that I've talked about, there has been a culture of caring that has surrounded, and I have been a part of propagating that culture of caring. So I come all the way back to where I started, which is, OK, why is it some companies do well and others don't? Why is it some companies are safer and more reliable? Why do some survive for 150 years and others struggle? And by now you know the answer, at least the one I believe. It's because their leaders create this culture of caring. And that's created by strong leaders that serve and strong leaders that lead with safety. Thank you very much. <laughs>